today for a very exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. In fact, we've had an audience joining us all week long for this epic series. Ms. Coburn joining on YouTube, a bunch of our live classes today. So a big thank you to you for joining us as we get to celebrate and showcase the coolest scientists and explorers on planet Earth. Now, if you have been joining us for this week, we have been joining uh, in partnership with the amazing folks of the Canadian Wildlife Federation for National Wildlife Week. Woohoo! If I had like a little streamer and hat, I would have that right now. I should have thought of it. I'll get it next time, I promise. But yes, it has been an incredible celebration of some of Canada's wildest places, wildest species, and the amazing work that is being done to save them. So not only have we been doing broadcasts on bats and whales and pollinators and what else did we do? Turtles yesterday. Geez, we did two in one day. It was too exciting. Um, but we have been showcasing all sorts of amazing resources. So throughout the broadcast, you'll just see me pepper these things in and I'll email all our registered classes with them uh, so that you can keep the learning going when we're done. You can also head to our YouTube channel and catch the entire series and like 3,200 other broadcasts that we've done since 2014. So lots of opportunity to get very, very excited. So please do check that out. Um, one last note, housekeeping before we dive in, we will have our fifth Kahoot in the series. So if you wanna join us for a four question quiz between our talk and our Q&A, you can go in with that pin in about 25 minutes. We're gonna have a little fun, test your understanding and win some bragging rights. I want to say too, I said this to our live classes, it's my birthday today. And as always my birthday, I have like a bevy of broadcasts. So I get to start off today with John. We've got Coral Reefs later. It's going to be a really exciting program day. So thank you all so much for joining me. This is the thrill of my life to get to do this job. And uh, yeah, I just can't wait to hang out with you for an amazing program on grassland birds. We've got the grasslands guy, John Wilshurst, and he's joining us in Jasper National Park, one of the most special places, not just in Canada, but the whole world. Um, so lucky John. And uh, I know you've got a lot to share with us today, so I'm going to zip my lip pretty soon and leave you to take us away with all this cool stuff you're up to. Thanks, Jesse, and uh, welcome, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. I want to have a shout out because I know the kids from Jasper Elementary are in the house, so I wanted to give a big cheer. I'm going to open my window, hang on a sec, see if I can hear you just down the street. Uh, uh, Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, not bad, not bad. All right. Okay, well, welcome everybody. My name is John Wilmshurst. I work for the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I am the grassland ecologist. Our organization is based way to the east of where I live in Ottawa, but I live in Jasper and I spend all my summers in the grasslands of Alberta, Manitoba and Saskatchewan studying grasslands. And today I want to give you a short presentation about birds on the grasslands. Now hang on a sec, it's going to take me a second to get the presentation up. Can I hit the share? Can I do that now, Jesse? Oh, yeah, please. I was going to say, while you're pulling that up, I actually heard the Jasper kids from here in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. So you guys wow, are so that was wild. Like, that was across wild. the country. <laughs> that was crazy. Okay, here we go. Beauty. And, uh, Is that working? You are golden, John. Take us away, you man. You birds at saying yuck. We sure do. <laughs> All right, here we go. So. There are grasslands around the world. And not only are there grasslands around the world, there are birds, thousands of species of birds that live in those grasslands. But from what we know about birds, not a lot of them eat grass. So today, I wanna to take you on a trip around the world, staying a little bit close to home. So we'll look a little bit at the grasslands of Canada and some of the Northern United States. And we're gonna learn a little bit about grass and we're gonna learn a lot about birds. And we're gonna answer that age old question, Oh, there we go. If birds don't eat grass, why do they live in grasslands? Now, I need you to remember that because that's going to be important throughout the slideshow, okay? And maybe it'll be part of the Kahoot quiz at the end. And Jesse, I know you can't talk right now. It's my show, but I want to be part of the Kahoot too. Just saying, just saying, no competition. Okay, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> so you guys are, are uh, pretty familiar with grass, I suspect. You know, you have grass in front of your schools, in the summertime, you'll have grass in front of your houses, in your neighborhoods. You'll have you'll be playing on grass, right? Soccer fields, baseball fields, football fields. 
we, we have grass all around us. And, but this is not actually the grass that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about wild grasses, grasses that are part of the wilderness and how they're important to birds. Now, I know grass is a little bit boring. You know, we don't really pay attention to it a lot. But unfortunately, if we're going to learn about grassland birds, we have to learn a little bit about grass, grasses themselves. So let's chat a little bit. This is one of my favorite grasses, by the way. You find this grass in the prairies of Canada. It's called needle and thread. You can see that it's got a little seed that has a long spike on it that helps it burrow into the ground and set seed for the next year. These are wild grasses. And North America has hundreds of species of wild grasses that many of us don't even know exist because they're not the same species that we have in our soccer fields. Now, another thing about grass is that it's a plant, of course. It has the typical things that plants have. It has roots, it has a stem, it has leaves, it even has flowers and a little seed. The flower is not very showy for most grasses. Sometimes it can be, but mostly it's not. And it's, uh, but it does have seeds and those seeds are really important. The, the panel on the left that you're seeing, that's actually a grass that grows not very far from me. It's called rough fescue. It grows in the mountains of uh, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains, Northern Rocky Mountains of Canada. That yellow bit on the top, that's the bit that sticks out of the ground. That's the grassy part. That big brown bit underneath, those are the roots. I find this picture super impressive because it just shows you how incredible grass can be. It's not just a little tiny thing sticking out of the ground, but there's this whole ecosystem under the earth that um, is important for the grasslands. Okay, now, if you learn anything today, what you need to know is that grass is really, 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 really hard to eat. It's not bad for you. It's not poisonous, typically. But it tastes terrible, and all the little nutrients in there that you need to live, you cannot get from grass. If you were to fill your belly with grass, you would starve to death because you cannot digest that stuff. There's very, very few animals on the planet that can actually digest the food that's in grass. One of them is the cow. Things like cows and bison and antelope and gazelles, they can eat grass and they can digest it. Well, actually, they don't even digest it themselves. And that's a whole other story that I'm going to come back next year if, you know, Jesse allows me to talk to you about that, about how um, animals that eat grass, mammals that eat grass can actually do it. They actually don't eat the grass themselves. They feed animals in their bellies and then those animals are eating the grass. And, but that's another story. I'm not going to go there right now. What I want to talk about are these guys. This is a little um, yellow-breasted chat. It lives on the grasslands of North America, but it does not eat grass because it can't digest it. And this leads us to one of the world's most important scientific questions ever, and that is, if birds don't eat grass, why do they live in grasslands? Okay, this is the clay collared sparrow. It's a beautiful little bird that uh, lives in the grasslands where I do a lot of work in Southern Saskatchewan. And I'm gonna take you now on a little trip around the world to show you where these birds could live. So there are grasslands on every continent in the world, except for Antarctica. You have the Great Plains in North America. You have the Pampas in South America. The huge area of South America is actually grassland. We have the steppe in Europe and Asia. Um, big, uh, big open area with lots of really exciting wildlife happening there. And of course, the savanna of Africa and the outback of Australia. I'm going to take you on a little sort of picture show of some of, these, some of the animals that you might find in these parts of the world. Let's start in Australia. Okay, on the top right and bottom left, this is a little bird called the golden-headed cysticola. It's a bird that lives in the grasslands or the outback of Australia. The cool thing about this bird, the only way to identify it is from the color of the inside of its mouth. Imagine the challenge that that is. On the bottom right is, a, is the emu. I'm going to show you a few pictures in subsequent slides of animals that are like emus. The weird thing about them is that they're a bird, but they can't fly. They're big. They're super fast runners. They live on grasslands. They don't eat grass. Top left is a kangaroo. Oh, that's not a bird. Sorry. Forgot about that part. Ah, you can't you can't show a slideshow where you bring in Australia and not show a kangaroo. They're pretty cool critters. Okay, next, let's go to South America. On the top left, you have what's called the lesser rhea. It's exactly like the emu. Smaller. Flightless, it can't fly, it's a bird. It lives in the grasslands, does not eat grass. Just like the bird on the top right, that's called the strange-tailed tyrant. It's a lot like a bird that we find out here in Western Canada called the loggerhead shrike. Um, really beautiful bird um, and uh, lives in the grassland, depends on the grassland, eats bugs. Bottom left-hand corner is a bird not 
like uh, not at all like the strange tail tyrant. This, the tyrant is a really showy bird. It likes to stand up on a post, show itself off. The pipit on the bottom left is a bird that we find all over the Great Plains of North America and even in South America, like here. And it hides in the grass. Really, really hard to see. Beautiful song. Lives in the grasslands. Does not eat grass. And then on the bottom right, we have the black-faced ibis. Big bird, really cool. Looks like it should be waiting on a beach somewhere in Cuba, but it is, does not. It lives in the grasslands of South America. Let's go to Africa. Of course, the ostrich, right? Just like the rhea, just like the emu. Big, flightless bird, super fast, lives in the grasslands, doesn't eat grass. Just like the, the, uh, the ground hornbill in the top right there. Look at that thing eating a snake. And that's what they eat. They live in the grasslands and the savannas of East Africa. And the secretary bird, pretty funny looking, weird animal. Call the secretary bird because it's got these feathers that stick out the back that look like feather pens. Um, uh, <laughs> really funny bird. Does fly, doesn't like to fly, prefers to walk. Now, we're in Africa now, and uh, that reminds me, I wanted to tell you a little bit about why I became a scientist and what, it was, what was so interesting to me about grasslands. When I was a brown, probably many of your ages, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old. I did the classic thing when I was in school, went on field trips where our biology teachers were telling us all about the wildlife in our neighborhoods. Um, and this is where my story started. We would go on the field trips, we would be asked to observe uh, the plants and the animals around us, draw them, ask questions about them, measure them, and uh, um, do the kinds of things that science teachers want you to do to observe the, the world around you. And I had one biology teacher and she when we were on one of the field trips, she said to us this challenge question. If all the world is green, why are there animals that go hungry every day? It's an interesting question because it's true. There's so many animals out there that are eating all this green vegetation and everything around us is green, particularly in the summer. Now, I know in the states down there in the south, it's green all year round. But in Canada, it's intensely green for the summer, summer months. And if all the world is green like this, why is it that animals are going hungry? And I kept that question in my head all throughout my schooling, through my elementary school and high school and into university. And when I went to university, I decided I wanted to study um, that question, but in terms of grasslands. So what is it about grasslands that make them so compelling for animals? I started my work looking at these creatures. So they, they live here in, in and around Jasper where I live and I studied them here. These are elk um, and they're a large um, mammal that can eat grass and makes its living eating grass. And I studied them for a bunch of years in Canada, and this gave me the opportunity to do this. This is a picture of me about 10,000 years ago, and I was here in the Serengeti ecosystem of East Africa mowing the lawn. That's what I did for three years there. I had a really great experience there. I studied a lot about the grasslands and the animals that live there, and I got to see a lot of really interesting birds. There's 500 different species of birds that live in the Serengeti on those grasslands. Really, really fascinating place. But there's other critters too. There's things like lions there, saw them a lot. Um, these are my favorite. This is one of my study animals it's called the Thompson's gazelle. Pretty beautiful little critter. And of course, there's birds. Now, a lot of the work that I did in Africa was done in the time before there was color. So I got a few black and white pictures for you here. These are some birds. Um, these are vultures. Again, really important grassland bird. Um, they live all throughout, all around the Serengeti, um, really important for that ecosystem. And, and anybody who knows me and the people from Jasper might know this, I can't do a slideshow about Africa without a picture of a hyena in the background. And you can see it probably has got a piece of wildebeest in its mouth and it's running away. But those are the, some of the, a picture of some of the grassland birds in the Serengeti. And then of course the ostriches. I love these guys. They were really hilarious. Um, super fast. They lay eggs all over the place. Um, you just be driving along and suddenly you find an ostrich egg. Again, another bird lives in the grassland, does not eat grass. Um, um, but the time that I lived in, in the Serengeti was really what, what really an important part of my life. Uh, it really is what we would call a formative experience. And it was when I was there that I decided that I really wanted to be a scientist, but I really wanted to protect the, the world that was around me. I wanted to do conservation. I wanted to work in protecting the species that I was observing. And I've been doing that for like the last 30 years. I've been working in mostly in grassland ecosystems with all kinds of different species, focusing on conserving them, understanding the interconnectedness amongst them, um, studying their science and their biology, and learning more about them so that we can have a reason then to conserve them from the future. And this is an important message, I think, for everybody about what science is. Science is not about knowing stuff. Science is about learning things. It's about discovery. And that really is compelling for me. And that 
those taught the, the three years that I spent in the grasslands of Africa really compelled me to, to build a career as a scientist, trying to learn more about the world around us and protect it and conserve it. Okay, but that lead me to, leads me to this age old question. If birds don't eat grass, why do they live in grasslands? Okay, I haven't talked much about the grasslands of North America yet, but I want to get on there a little bit. Okay, show you some pictures of some birds that we find in the grasslands, tell you a little bit about them. This is a bird that's really important in North America right now. It's called the sage grouse. It lives in the open plains of uh, Montana and Wyoming. Um, also, in, in to some extent, in Utah and Idaho, you can find them, but also in southern Canada. In Canada, they're almost extinct. Their grassland habitat is rapidly being uh, converted for other uses like crops, and there's very few places in Alberta where they can live, and likely within the next 10 years, you won't be able to find this species in Canada anymore. Um, uh, this is one of the few birds that I'm going to show that actually does kind of eat grass. It eats sage. Now, sage is not quite grass. It's a bit of a shrub, but it's a leafy green. It's the same thing that you put in your turkey at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, and uh, these birds, that's what they do. This is a male. He's displaying so he can attract some females. Um, this is the loggerhead shrike. This is the bird that I talked to you about before. Cool little bird, lives in the grasslands all throughout North America. Um, it is like a little tiny hawk. And what it does is it goes and it catches insects out of the air and brings them back to a thorn or a barbed wire and will impale them on that thorn or barbed wire. That's how it kills its prey. It's kind of a little bit gruesome, but, but super interesting. And then there's these guys. This is an owl. Now, we always think of owls as, you know, living in a barn or up in a tree and hoo hooting away. But this is called the burrowing owl. It lives in the grasslands of North America. It doesn't actually, it's called a burrowing owl, but it actually doesn't burrow. It lives in the holes that are made by other animals like gophers and badgers and things like that. And it um, and it eats mice like a lot of owls do. It spends its entire summer in the Northern Great Plains. So that area again of, uh, of Alberta and Saskatchewan, not so much Manitoba anymore, but also in Montana and Wyoming and will um, fly south into Texas and Mexico for the winter. And look at this little crazy dude. This is called a long-billed curlew. Super interesting grassland bird because, excuse me, it's a wading bird. Normally when you look for birds like this, you would find it on the shores, picking through the sand, living in the surf. But in the summer times, when it comes north to Canada, it spends its entire time in the grasslands. It uh, and um, wanders around the open plains using its bill to probe through the soil, looking for its food there. And then I want to show you this one. This is a bit of a weird bird. This is called a brown thrasher. It is um, lives in the sort of the shrubby areas of the grasslands. Um, I just think it's kind of a funny looking bird with those big, big yellow eyes. But what is like this bird, the brown thrasher, and the other birds that I showed you, it lives in grassland, but it doesn't eat grass. So I work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. I am a researcher. I do grassland research. And one of the things that I've been doing for the last number of years is trying to answer that question of if birds live in the grasslands, why aren't they eating grass? And we think we might have figured out part of the problem. We're not quite there yet. We don't know all the answers and that's important, but I'm gonna think, I think I'm gonna be able to give you a few hints as to what's going on. So even though birds on the grasslands don't eat grass, they eat things that eat grass. And I think that's part of the answer to the question. Things like this grasshopper, things like this beetle, they are not really interested in the grass themselves, but they really are interested in the insects that eat themselves eat that grass. Now, why are they doing that? This is a savanna sparrow, lives in the grasslands all across North America. Um, and it's actually a seed eating bird. So when it, especially in the winter, when it's not in Canada, but it's in the Southern part of the Great Plains, it eats mostly seeds, um, all the kind of seeds it can find, even crop seeds like corn and wheat and things like that, it'll eat those. That's its preferred food. But when they come North into the Northern Great Plains in the summertime, they're there to, to make babies. And you can see there's a bunch of chicks in this nest and there's the mama bird with a beak full of insects and she's gonna feed her chicks these insects. Now these little birds, this is probably a picture taken in maybe late May, early June in Canada. Um, these little birds have to grow up in two months time to be as big as mama here and strong enough to fly all the way to Texas, Mexico and South America in the winter to avoid the Canadian, uh, to avoid the Canadian snow and cold. And so they can't do that. They can't grow that fast 
if they're only living on grass and seeds. So the mums and the dads of these grassland birds have to feed them something that's a little richer, fatter, with more protein. And those are the grassland insects. And so that's what this mama bird is doing. She's feeding her little chicks uh, caterpillars there that she's found in the grasslands. And so that's why we think that grassland birds live in grasslands, not to eat grass, but to eat the things that eat grass. Now, these are some of the insects that we collected um, in the Saskatchewan grasslands last summer. Um, and you can see this is just a part of the collection. These are all grasshoppers. They're in what's called the Canadian National Collection based in Ottawa. And this is just one drawer out of literally thousands of drawers of insects that you can find there, many of them from the grasslands all across North America. And it just shows you how many different species of insects, how much food is available for grassland birds in, um, in Canada in the summertime. This is just a small fraction, but this is why the birds are not eating grass, but they're nevertheless in the grasslands because there's so much food available to them. Now, one of the things that we need to talk about is the interconnectedness of grassland ecosystems. So I've talked about how grass is important for bugs and for birds, and it's also important for larger animals, like, a, like I mentioned earlier, like deer and antelope and, um, and, and pronghorn and things like that. Lots of different animals depend on wild grasslands to live, but we also depend on wild grasslands to live. They're important for us. Now, this is also a grassland of sorts. This is a field of wheat. Now, wheat is a grass. We don't eat the grass per se. What we do is we eat the seed from the grass. And this is a really important part of what grasslands provide for people. Now, in Canada, we've turned more than 75% of our wild native grasslands into agricultural areas. And that's been an important part of the whole history of North America, the conversion of grasslands into crops. And in order to manage those crops, farmers have to fertilize the ground and they often have to spray for pests. When they spray for pests, they are spraying to kill insects, insects that if they left them alone would eat all of the, all of the seeds and all of the wheat grains and all of the canola seeds in the fields and leave nothing for their crop for, for us, for our bread and for our oils and things like that. And so um, the, it's important that they go through these agricultural processes, but we have to find the balance there, right? When they're spraying for insects, those are the insects that the birds need to eat or need to capture to feed their young so that their young can migrate south. And so these are the important questions that we're trying to answer as scientists these days is how do we find that balance between providing enough food for people on places like the Great Plains, but also providing space for wildlife to, to grow and to live. It's kind of like the forests. You know, we need the wood to build our houses, but we can't cut down all the forests. We have to leave some behind. And this is the principle that we're looking at when we talk about grassland conservation. How much of the grassland do we need to protect and conserve in order to make sure that there's enough left for the wildlife? Um, this is just a quick picture. This is a, an image of all of uh, North America. The colored area is really the Great Plains of North America. And you can see all the American states and up north, the provinces in Canada, and you can see the different colors. Um, these are, the red color is that area that is under threat, most likely to be converted to crops from native wild wilderness grasslands. And so when we do conservation, we focus on these areas in red. The green areas are places that are pretty safe. They're not likely going to be converted to agricultural use, but the red areas, and you can see in the up in the, the top center of the screen, that's Saskatchewan, where I do a lot of my work, a lot of that area could be useful for agriculture. And so we are working to study how that connection between wildlife and agriculture and grass and soils and carbon and all those different things work together so that we can protect the right amount of grassland um, for, for wildlife. And it's actually pretty cool work. I hire students. They're all young people, um, sort of late high school, early university age. And we go out into the grasslands every summer and we work with our partners at Birds Canada who are listening for birds every morning. Um, in the same plots where we were working with some Saskatchewan beef producers and they measure the grasses for us and we collect the insects and we have all these crews working in the same place at the same time. We're trying to find that connection that, you know, why is it that there are grassland birds living in this space, not eating grass, but finding insects? What are the insects doing? How many are there? What types are there? That kind of thing. We're doing all these kinds of really interesting experiments 
um, in the grasslands in cooperation with farmers to learn more about this interconnectedness of grasses and grasslands. Okay, so I'm getting to the end. What can you do? Conservation is important. That balance is important. The first thing and the most important thing for all of us to do all the time is to learn more. We can just leave it there. But it says here, learn more about local species and the challenges that they face. That's important. That's what I did as a kid. You know, I was out there doing field trips with my biology class, learning about my local species and learning back in the classroom what challenges to, to the species that I learned about face. Um, one of the things that you can do is uh, contribute to um, um, uh, uh, what's called citizen science through apps. There's one called iNaturalist. That is an app that I use all the time. You can take a picture of a plant or a bug or a bird or a mammal or whatever you find in your neighborhood, um, lo load it onto the web, and then some expert will come and help you identify it, which I think is pretty cool. I did it last weekend. I was skiing and I saw some bugs walking across the ice and I took a picture of the bugs and sure enough, some, um, put it on the iNaturalist app and a few, uh, about a day later, an, uh, uh, an expert came through and told me what the bug was. It was a caddis fly, super cool. The other thing you can do is connect with clubs and conservation groups, um, working on projects in your area and volunteer with those groups just to make a contribution to your local neighborhood. And of course, share what you've learned with your family and friends. They'll be astounded at how much you, how much you know and how much you've learned. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks for watching and, and listening. And Jesse, I think we've got the, the, uh, the, the, the Kahoot coming up and I can also answer questions. John, that was spectacular. Thank you so, so much for such a detailed overview. And honestly, like I was gripped at the beginning to end of that. That was so much fun. Also, I know we're focusing on Canada today, but the fact that we had a little Serengeti going in there, one of the most special ecosystems on the planet, my favorite thing I've ever done and gone to the sea. So I uh, appreciate the extra plug for that. As you mentioned, we're going to do our Kahoot together. So if you're new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And what you win is John and I's everlasting respect, which is pretty cool for a broadcast. So please feel free to chime in. Don't worry if you don't want to play. You can yell out the answers in your class as well. That's totally fine. Uh, but we're going to get this going. And John, what you can do is if you want to help us out with hints when we're near the, the end of each one of the questions, that would be spectacular. So let's dive in, everybody, and get underway. I hope a bird name wins this. We haven't had a thematic name win in a while. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Question one. True or false? We have owls in Canada that sleep underground. So we talked about these. We showed them. The picture might even give it away. But if there's one thing that I want you to take from this, it's these guys, because so few Canadians or people in the world know that these exist, and they're such a wonderful bird. We did have one of our classes say that they saw these birds. Uh, so, Mr. Girl, thank you so much for highlighting that you've seen a burrowing owl in person. I hope everyone gets this right. True, yes. Burrow yeah. owls, they're a great bird. And I'm glad you guys followed along with that. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, we do it. We have a bird named Leading. Lovely. Okay, I'm, I'm not don't usually root for individuals, but I hope you win. Canada's major grasslands are dot dot dot. Where are they? Are they all in Ontario? Ontario would love that. Are they largely on the East Coast? Are they right in the heart of the country in the prairies? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Or are they spread evenly everywhere? Where are our grasslands? If anyone's had the chance, I mean, John's in Jasper, so uh, he's in a province that has a lot of grasslands. I've been to Saskatchewan, sort of our iconic grassland province. Ooh, we really threw people off with this one, but it is right in the heart of the country in the prairies. So Saskatchewan, Alberta, in Manitoba. Uh, if you ever get the chance to take the train across Canada, you are in grasslands, either natural or uh, certainly agriculture, for two days. It's quite the quite the all right. Oh, that completely threw off our leaderboard. It's mass chaos. We've got an ostrich in second, though. All right. What is the biggest threat to grassland habitats? We talked a little bit about this. John had a great slide near the end. Is it climate change? Always a big threat. Pollution, conversion to agriculture, or being eaten by locusts? Fortunately, we don't really have this final one as a problem in Canada so much. It is in other parts of the world. Locust infestations are, are a big deal. But this is something that we've been coming to all Canadian Wildlife Federation series long. It is conversion to agriculture. It's habitat loss. If we don't have, like, you need a house. I'm in a house. John's in a house right now. We're lucky us. If animals don't have homes and places to live, it's hard for them to survive. And so it might look similar when you have a big farm field of wheat, but it's not at all the same for our wildlife. Really important to keep those native grasslands. All right. 
John, I'm almost done talking, and then we're going to do our, our fantastic Q&A. This is our final question to Kahoot. Uh, Expert Otter has our lead as we go into question number four. I added a few to this. You had your last slides about what you can do to help. Tell your friends that you've learned. Donate to conservation groups like, say, the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Use iNaturalist and other tools to explore local wildlife. Or, as is pretty much always the case when I do a Kahoot, maybe it's all of the above. Hmm. Let's see. It is. It is all of the above. So, guys, you guys did an amazing job. Thank you so much for playing along with our Kahoot. We're going to go to Miss Hanshaw's class in just a second for our Q&A. So our second graders in West Virginia, we can kick off with you. Ivy Macklin, please do share in the chat. Miss McAdam and our yellow team crews, I'm coming to you right after. But our winner of our Kahoot for all the marbles, Joyful Ostrich, it was, it was a bird. Yes. Hey. So, way to go. Let us know if you are here with folks in the chat. And YouTubers, you guys have shared so many questions, which is amazing. But let's head to Miss Inshaw's class to kick us off. Uh, if you guys want to unmute your mic, you can ask John anything you want about grasslands or birds or what have you. All right. They're uh, coming back from their nest. All right, yeah. guys. Does anybody have a, have a question about it? Gosh, they're so they had some good discussion before then. Anybody, Sebastian, can you think of a question? No. That's okay. <laughs> you, can always, you know what? John did cover a lot. So if you don't have any questions, <laughs> right. you were very thorough. So we'll come back in a minute, Ms. Henshaw. I'm, Ivy Macklin, if you guys want to put something in the chat, please do. But Ms. McAdams' class, I'm going to come to you guys first then. Come on in and join us and uh, take us away. Unmute your mic and you're good to go. Hey, guys. Mm -hmm. See. Perfect. Perfect. How many? Oh, could you repeat that for us? Try again. How many different species of grassland birds are there? Ooh, no pressure. Ooh, that's a really good. What's your What's your name? Oh, I'll Alice. bring it back. Alex. What's your name? Alice. 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 Thanks, Alice. Alice, I can tell you're going to grow up to be a scientist because that's an excellent question. And I talked about this a little bit earlier. So how many species of grassland birds are there? There are hundreds, and I actually don't know the answer to it. Um, and I'm not sure that really anybody knows the answer to it because there are grasslands all over the world and there's all kinds of different things happening with them. And so one of the things that scientists do is that we ask questions like that and try to find answers to them. And so that's the most important thing is to ask the right question. Now, those are really, you know, there, there are, like I said, when I was working in Africa, there were 500 different species of birds just in that Serengeti area alone. And there are several hundred in Canada, all over through the United States. So I'm not sure that anybody really knows the answer to that question, Alice. But uh, you grew up to be a scientist and you can answer it. Seriously, and I'm so glad that we have highlighted this. Like, Stump the Scientist is one of the great joys of exploring by the city of your <laughs> You kick it off with the first question. So way to go, Alex. Uh, Yellow Team crew, I'm going to head to you guys next live, and then we'll take a few from our YouTube friends. Come on in, everybody. Hey, welcome in. Go close, uh, go close. Uh, what's the name of the bird that's going extinct? That is called the sage grouse. Yeah. So there, I'm going to bring up the name on screen for everybody. Uh, yeah. So they're one of my favorite birds in the world. They're such a special animal. Um, yeah. National Geographic did an amazing series featuring them uh, not too, too long ago. But really, look up sage grouse. They're such a special animal. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really important that we work to protect them because we don't want to lose such a terrible no. Yeah, they're really, and there's not very many left in Canada. There's a few more left in the States, but boy, their habitat is disappearing quickly. So we really have to work hard to protect them. Yeah, great question, guys. All right. We're going to take some from our YouTube friends and Ivy Macklin. So many. Let's see. Um, ooh, from Miss Agrell Smith, they're the ones who saw the burrowing owl. They want to know, at what age are most birds in the grassland able to fly? They'll just be a few months old. So most of those little birds are born in, you know, June. And they can fly by the time August comes around. They have to be able to fly, particularly the ones that are growing up in the Canadian grasslands. They have to be able to fly before um, before winter comes because they can't. They're not tough enough to survive the winters. Most of them. There are a few birds that hang around in the winter in the prairies in Canada, but not that many. Most of them migrate south where it's warm and where there's you know food for them in the south. And so they have to be. They're going to only be a few months old when they learn to fly. I'm really glad we got this question, and we did this in one of our other broadcasts in the series. Humans have really cushy lives. Like we get to like. Yeah. And parents feed us, and they, yeah. you know, until we're like 18 or 30, if you're a millennial. Um, and so, for most animals, you need to run or swim or fly. Like, yeah. 
pretty much immediately because things will eat you if you don't. So it's yeah. very important that they have those skills, quote unquote, um, to begin their life. Great. Question. When I was working in the Serengeti, there's all kinds of these animals there called wildebeest. They're also yes. known as gnus, and they can walk within half an hour after being born. It takes most humans, it takes us like a year, year and a half to learn how to walk after we're born. They're walking and running with their moms within half an hour of being born. So that's a, that was a great question. It's a great question. My head has actually remained the same size since birth. So I actually never <laughs> I walk, and there are pictures that can prove this. Um, let's see some other great questions. Wow. Miss Cork's class is a great question in Stratford. They want to know how much of the pesticides from farming affecting the insect population on the grass? Oh, that's a, that's a huge question, and that's a really big deal. And it's not only affecting the insects that birds eat, but it's affecting the the insects that pollinate uh, foods like bees and things like that. And it kind of kind of depends on the pesticides that we're talking about. So a lot of pesticides are actually pretty mild. They only target um, insects that are really going to be eating the crops. But there's a type of pesticide called a neonicotinide. And they are a generalist pesticide that is very, very, very hard on all kinds of insects. Um, and so there are, um, and they are, uh, they're, they're killing all kinds of insects across the prairies, not all, and they drift. So they tend to drift beyond the crop fields. Um, we work with a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. Her name is Dr. Christy Morrissey. And she is exactly asking that question now. What is the effect of pesticides used on crops, particularly neonicotinides, on on grassland birds and on the insects and it's a difficult question to answer because there's just so many different types of pesticides that are used and so many different types of insects but it's a question that we're working on now and you know that's how science works right we're, we're here to answer the questions we don't know the answers we don't know all the answers but we're working on it yeah, what a thoughtful and fantastic answer. Thanks, John. Um, okay, ID Macklin, I know your devices aren't working, but a big welcome into you guys. Thank you so much for joining in Alberta today. They want to know, are there any fruit in grasslands for the birds to eat? Are there any glorious apples growing anywhere, or what's the deal? Yeah, you know, um, it's a good question. It depends on what you call a fruit, because there's lots of berries on the grasslands that birds will kind of eat, and they like, they'll eat the fruit off the berries and then eat the seed as well. So there's things like buffalo berries and Saskatoons and things like that. Um, and there are, you know, some smaller apples, not a lot of native fruit, um, fruit on the on the prairies, like that kind of bigger, you know, pears or mangoes or stuff like that. You don't see that certainly in Canada, but you do have smaller kind of uh, berries that birds will eat. And there are, um, you'll see that mostly in the fall. So after the chicks are totally grown, the, the moms and dads, they really don't want to have to, you know, feed any more insects. So they might shift to some of those berries. None of those berries are ripe in August and September. And that's kind of perfect timing, right? The insects have gone away because we've had a little bit of frost. And so the berries are starting to ripen. And so the birds shift from eating bugs all the time to eating eating berries and the seeds that are in the berries. So that's another excellent question. It is an excellent question. You guys are doing an amazing job, audience. So thank yeah. you very much for that. Yeah. We're gonna head back to our yellow team crew and then I'm gonna take some more from YouTube, including Jasper Elementary. Welcome in guys. Uh, but all right. on, yellow team and take us away. Hey. Oh, all right. Uh is there multiple owl? Is there multiple owl, um, type of furring owl species in Canada? Yeah, fascinating. Thanks for the question. Well, that's a really good question. No, there's only one species of burrowing owl. There's a bunch of owls that live on the prairies. They'll live in like live in the trees and in barns and things like that. But there's only one species of owl that lives in the ground. That's the burrowing owl, and there's only one species of burrowing owl. So if we lose those guys. Uh, that's it. That's it for uh, grassland owls, really. Yeah, I'm really glad we got that question. Thanks, Guy. That was um, great. Thank you. Right Thanks for Jasper. That was awesome. Seriously, yeah. Um, we'll head to um, our Jasper crew on YouTube, actually. Miss McDonald's class. They want oh, to know okay. a specific title for people who's. Are you a grasslandologist? What's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a. I, I know we can make it up. Why don't we put it in the chat? what you think a grassland ecologist should be called. Because I don't think there is one yet. I've always called myself a grassland ecologist, but if you can come up with a fancier word, throw it in the chat and I, I will use it. And, if you, and next time you come on, when I'm here, I will use it in my tagline. It won't be the grassland guy anymore. It'll be the grassland ecologist, grasslandologist or whatever you want yeah, to call yeah. it. Yeah, we've got five minutes left. If you guys do chime <laughs> in on YouTube or stream your chat, I will absolutely bring up your answers uh, as we go right. the podcast here. Um, let's see, we've got time for a few more questions together, everyone. Oh, uh, Mr. Girl Smith, how tall can grasses grow in the grasslands? 
That's a really great question. Um, there's not only one type of grassland, there's very many types of grasslands. So there's a, a type of grassland that you find in sort of southern Canada and then all throughout the southern states is called the short grass grasslands. And there the grasses are only like, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 centimeters tall, maybe what is that, five to eight inches in that range. So typically really, really short. But there are also tall grass prairies. You find those in North America. You find them in Minnesota and Manitoba. And there you get grasses that are three or four feet, almost a meter tall. And when I was working in Africa, in the northern part of the Serengeti, there were grasses that were taller than my Land Rover, the, the Jeep that I drove around all the time. They would be about two or three meters tall. So grass can be super, super short, like just a couple of centimeters, an inch or so, or they can be super, super tall. It kind of depends on where they are. All right, I've got some uh, answers for what you should be called. So from our StreamYard crews, you've got grassland <laughs> scientist and grassland expertologist. And okay. Yep. Grassologist you from Sweet. YouTube. I thought stalker for grass stalks, but maybe a bad connotation. Well, that makes me, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't want <laughs> yeah. that. I don't want that. Oh, guys, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for this. We're going to take one more from YouTube, one more from our yellow team, and then we're going to wrap up together. At the 40-minute mark, I want to note, too, there is so much more you can discover. So if you're keen on all of this, check out the education page. Check out the Land Who's Who. Check out the amazing National Wildlife Week and go to our YouTube channel for more. We're going to send all this to all you teachers, so stay tuned for that in just a minute. Uh, but let's wrap up with a couple questions first. Let's see. YouTubers, I'm going to come to you first. Hmm. What? Oh, geez. Oh, Miss Cork wanted to know how many types of grasses are there in the grasslands? It's like the. It's like how many birds there are. So again, <laughs> you know, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question. There are thousands. I can go to my bookshelf. Here it is. Okay, here's a book in my bookshelf called Prairie Grasses. Um, this is put out a long time ago, and there's I don't know how many pages are there in this book. There's 250 pages in this book, so there's at least 250 species of grasses just in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, I know when I was working in Africa, there was probably about 300 different species of grasses there. Um, and there's different ones. Some of the grasses you can find all over the world. They'll, you'll find the same grass you see in, in Africa, you'll find it in South America and in, in the United States. And so, ah, it's thousands. The, word, the answer is thousands. But again, you know, all you guys out there in, um, in, uh, in school right now, in elementary school, these are going to be the questions that you'll have a chance to answer when you become scientists as you grow older. What a beautiful answer. Thank you so, so much, John. This has been so much fun. We're going to wrap up with one more question from our yellow team crew. Come on in, guys. Take us away. Uh, uh, what, what is the name of the bird that sticks the bugs on the fence and kills the oh, That's called a loggerhead shrike. S H, you can put that in the in the we'll yep. fire that up there, Jesse. Maybe loggerhead shrike. Um, there's a couple of different types of shrikes. It's also called a butcher bird, which is a really harsh name, but it's also called that. Yeah, and that's what it does. It catches insects when they're flying and will um, um, stick them onto a thorn. There's a there's a type of plant in the prairies called the thorny buffalo berry, um, and it lives mostly near little creeks and rivers and things like that. And um, and it has big long thorns. And if you go to those bushes, sometimes you'll see all these grasshoppers and beetles and bees and stuff stuck on impaled on these uh, on the thorns. It's really quite cool. John, I like that there are two people that like find shrikes fascinating, but they're so it is. It's kind of yeah. rude, kind of weird, but they're such yeah. a fascinating bird, and they yeah. they are they're you wouldn't expect it from them. Like they just look like a sort of normal bird as opposed to something that you'd think I don't know have a little bit of an edge to it. So I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks, yellow team. John, before we wrap up, is there any yeah. last message you want to leave our kids with before we bring in our yellow team and our other crew to say a big thank you and farewell? Um. You know, the message that I like to give to kids all over the world is that science, you know, we're scientists, right? We're all scientists because we're all asking questions and we're all trying to answer them. And the thing to know when you see a guy like me who you think is an expert, really what's most important is not the things that I know, but the things that I don't know. And that's the key to science. It is exploring the things that you don't know to try to find the answers to the questions. And so uh, that's the message that I like to give. There's no better message than that. It's something that applies whether our scientists are grassland experts, grassologists like John, or, <laughs> or chemists or geologists. We're always seeking to learn more. That's why we do these broadcasts to get you guys inspired and hopefully you all uh, either become scientists or recognize the value of science and that uh, as a backdrop. So, Absolutely. Guys, thank you so, so much. Uh, I'll bring in Caitlin's message. It was such a beautiful message to wrap up with. I'll say our yellow team, uh, thank you so much. If you guys want to come in and join me and saying thank you and farewell, welcome yeah. in, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>